It's going to be a fun morning as we continue in our series on equipping and continuing how we can grow in what God has gifted us to do. And, uh, and so we're going to pick up, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a synopsis as we dive right. Can we just dive right in? You all good with that today? I'm going to give you a little bit of a synopsis uh, of uh, so we can dive in to where we were at last week. And we're walking through the story of David and uh, how he went from being a dreamer who lived in the fields, right, tending to the sheep, tending to the goats, to being the king of the Israelites, God's chosen people. But we're learning some things about David that I think it's really imperative that we understand. David was simply a shepherd boy. He was a servant, a dreamer. David was chosen. Have you ever felt, you remember back to the days when you were in school and they were picking teams for dodgeball and you always felt like you were the one that was left out? I was never part of that because I was always the biggest kid who could throw the hardest. David was chosen. David killed lions and bears. David was confident. Here's where David becomes human. David made some poor decisions. I don't know about you, but I don't tend to look back on the things that I celebrated. I'm one of those people who tends to look back and find where I made poor choices and wish I would have done something different. David was courageous, made mistakes, had regrets. David was probably emotional. David was one who was hunted and did some hunting. But in everything what we learn about David, David was obedient. Now, I want you to think through those things for a second. Being a servant, a dreamer, somebody who made poor choices, somebody who was courageous. That sounds like a pretty crazy adventure. I'm going to go that I would, I would take this assessment, if you will, and make this assertion to you that if you were to give Hollywood this script of David's life that included all these emotional highs and these lows, this would probably be a box office hit. We can learn something from David today. You ready what we can learn? Following Jesus is full of emotions. It's been stated by many different psychologists that there are 10 basic emotions that humans have. Just 10. I don't know about you, it feels like in my house there's a lot more than 10. (laughs) The first one, fear. I don't know about you, I've never met anybody who's dealt with fear. And fear grasps us from the inside. Fear causes us to make choices And avoid things to avoid what? Fear. Anger. Ever been angry? Dads are like, not me. What about some shame? Contempt? Disgust. Ever watched something on TV and you were just absolutely disgusted? I don't care what news station you watch. This side of the room got that. (laughs) Guilt. Ever felt guilty? You think David felt guilty? What about distress? Interests. What piques your interest? Surprise. And the last is joy. Emotions intensify our motivation and instigate our behavior. I want you to think about that for just a moment. What motivates me to do what I do? If your your emotions about your job are poor, are you going to be motivated tomorrow morning to wake up and be at work on time? Our emotions intensify our motivation and they instigate the choices, the behaviors that we choose. How I choose to behave how I choose to spend my time, how I choose to invest finances, how I choose to interact with my friends, how I choose to engage with my family, how I choose to operate at work, how I choose to connect at church, how I choose to follow Jesus. Emotions even instigate our choices to grow in the gifts and the talents and the blessings that God has given us. These are the choices we make are products of our emotions. David's life was full of emotional highs, emotional lows. 
And maybe you're new to Anchor, and we've been talking about this over the course of, of the last year. Emotions are our guards, but they are not our guides. Our guide is God, which means my eyes and my emotions are fixated in His direction. Now, David had many instances in his life where he hit the mark right on. And then guess what? David missed completely. His emotions instigated his behavior. His emotions intensified his motivation. Now, I find it interesting that all of the 10 basic emotions that we have, there is only one of them that we find as the, in the fruit of the Spirit. So the more we have Jesus in us, there's only one of the emotions that is actually of Christ. And it's the last one, which is joy. You don't find fear in Jesus. You don't find anger in Jesus. You don't find shame in Jesus. You don't find contempt, disgust, guilt, distress, interest, or surprise in Jesus. But you will find joy. Joy in the good times. Joy in the bad times. Joy in the emotional times. Now here's David. He's been hanging out in the fields protecting and fighting for the sheep. And he had been fighting against the wolves and fighting the lions and fighting the bears. And he was fighting for the sheep. He, and now David has been called in from the fields. He's been anointed the, king, the future king of Israel. And, and uh, he went and honored his father and his brothers and by serving, by meeting some of their basic needs. And, and at the request of his dad, he simply took his brothers out in the battlefield, some food and and in tow with him, and this is what I find so incredible about this. And this is why I believe the greatest adventure you should ever venture on is your relationship with Jesus, right? Your walk with Christ is the greatest adventure. Because in tow, we look at David's story and we say, well, you took some grain and you may have took some cheese and you took some bread. And that's what all we assume that David had in tow with him that day. But the truth is, in tow with him on that journey to check in with his brothers was every emotion that he had ever had with him. Every victory, defeat, stress, chaos, all the nerves, the excitement, the sorrow, the pain, the regret, and every bit of motivation, all of this was with David as he approaches the fields where King Saul's army was fighting against the Philistine army. And this is what he finds. He found a battlefield that was loud and full of cries. He found on one side of the field you have the Israelite army, and on the other side of the field... You have the Philistines. And he simply chooses, I'm going to leave the supplies that my dad brought, sent me to give to my brothers and to their captain. Okay, I'm going to simply leave this with the person who is the keeper of supplies. And I'm going to go check in with my brothers. You see, he was still in a posture of obedience. His dad said, Jesse looked at him and said, go check in with your brothers. So David finds his brothers and begins to check in with them and just as he had been instructed. He was simply still in his position of service and his posture of obedience. Out of the crowd, he hears this loud, taunting voice. The Israelites begin to run away, full of what emotion? Fear. The entire army is afraid. They're so afraid, even King Saul is afraid. Nobody wanted to fight this specific Philistine. King Saul was so afraid that he even offered one of his daughters as a wife to the man who could take Goliath out. Now you would think for every man that would be, man, I can marry the king's daughter? Oh yeah. Well, that was if that wasn't sweet enough, King Saul then exempted that person, whoever took Goliath out, from ever paying taxes again. Who would sign up for that today in the name of Jesus? Amen. I don't need you. You keep your daughter. I don't want to give you any taxes. I'm telling you, somebody here is like, man, if that would happen today. So David's brothers see this. They see him talking, right? They see him going around having conversation with the other soldiers, and they begin to start questioning what David was doing. They even start getting angry. Can you imagine? All David did was obey his father, and now his brothers are getting angry with him. They said to David, you have a job to do back home. You best go get to it. You know what I find interesting about when transitions happen in our journey with Christ? When a season comes and a season ends and we're having to make a, make a move 
from what was God's plan, like what was where we believed God was when God makes a move and wants us to go somewhere else. There's a lot of times the people closest to us are the voices that keep us from moving forward. And when we pray for God to remove enemies out of our life, we start to realize we have to lose friends to do that. His brothers, you have a job to do back home. Go get at it. Because it's amazing how we get territorial when we start to feel threatened. Someone who does what we do better than us. You ever felt threatened by somebody who does what you do better? Rather than increasing your level of excellence and your expectation of yourself, you try to degrade them and push them away. We see them as a threat, so we tell them to go back where their job was. David begins to ask around, man, you guys are a bunch of scaredy cats here. Really? Who can defy the army of the living God? I love this. And David is just screaming. I can imagine from every ounce in his body, he was saying, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who is this dude? He may be tall, large, and loud, but I serve the God who shuts the mouths of lions. King Saul hears about the questions David asking, and he sends for David. And this is where we're going to pick up the story in the book of 1 Samuel. So if you have your Bibles or the Bible app on your phone, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Once you get there, if you would stand with me this morning as, as we read God's Word, we're going to be starting in verse 32. Don't worry about the Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. So while the rest of the Israelite army is running for the hills, David says, don't worry about him. I'll go fight him. King Saul says, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. David persisted, I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. And he said, and when a lion and a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. David was the original Bear Grylls, I'm just telling you. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of a lion and a bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Have you ever said that to somebody? Oh, and may the Lord be with you. When the truth is, you say that, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah you know what's about to happen. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. David said, I can't go in these. He protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off, picked up five smooth stones from the stream, put them into a shepherd's bag, then armed with only his staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. If you think about that, it's amazing how many valley time experiences we have to walk through to experience mountaintop victories. Goliath walked out toward David with a shield and shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog? He roared to David that you come at me with a stick. He cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. And David replied to the Philistine with every emotion that he had within him, I believe. You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have to defy. Today the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head. Tell me this wouldn't be a box office hit down over at the movie theater. Come on. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men. You see, Goliath was focused on killing David. David was focused on conquering the Philistines, right? Because David's dreams were a lot bigger than Goliath's vision. I will give your dead bodies of the men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Everyone assembled here will know that God rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. Goliath moved closer to attack. David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. 
And see, everybody thinks Goliath is dead. Because there's a lot of times when you're moving from one season to the other, you hit that season in the forehead with a stone and you assume it's dead. And then you walk over and you've got to do what David he did. He runs over, pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath, and David used his own sword to kill him and cut off his head. Today, Jesus, let this text come alive to us. That, God, you've gifted us. God, and part of that is we have emotions and we have struggles, we have victories and we have defeats. But, God, we always have had the ability to hear and be obedient and follow your voice. Lord, help us. Let this come alive in us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing in honor of God's word. David did what no other soldier was willing to do. His faith in God guided his emotions and rather than his emotions interfering with a job that needed to be done. He didn't need Saul's armor. He didn't need any affirmation from the other soldiers. And he really didn't need any encouragement from his brothers. His faith, truthfully, if you think about this, his faith was actually still too small for God. He grabbed five stones but only needed one. Friend, with God, you don't need a contingency plan. You don't need a backup plan. And you don't need any resource but Him. We grow in our gifts when we prioritize our faith and not our talent. If talent is what you are building your faith upon, you are building your faith with multiple stones in your sheath that are unnecessary. Faith comes first. David conquered the Philistine. And get this, David conquered the Philistine many years before that battle ever happened. So many times we fight the battle in front of us and we don't realize that we've actually been fighting that battle for a really long time. David, think about this. When David had to defeat that first lion, when he had to conquer that first lonely night out in the field staring at the stars all by himself, when he had to wrestle with that first bear, when he had to overcome the brothers who thought he would never amount to anything. I mean, think back to when, right, when Samuel came to anoint him as king and his brothers are sitting there astonished like, there's no way you're choosing him. Every time David had to cross one of those barriers, the Lord was preparing David to not defeat the Philistine. This is what's important. The Lord wasn't preparing David to defeat the Philistine. The Lord was preparing David to be obedient. Killing Goliath was not David's purpose. Serving God was David's purpose. Our identity is focused on what we do and not what we're becoming. I want you to think about this for a minute. Walking with Jesus has never been about what you do. It's about what you're becoming. David was a servant of the Most High God. And on that particular day, the obedience call from God was to defeat Goliath. But so many of us, we run out into the fields only concerned with the defeats from our past. David walked out and said, hey, look where God's blessed me. Look where God has rescued me. And if God rescued me then, then you better believe God's going to rescue me now. Now it's really intriguing. And if you're a young person in the room today, David couldn't exactly put on his Twitter profile that he was this Philistine conqueror. He couldn't send a snap to his buddies back in the fields watching the sheep and the goats of him holding the head of Goliath right here, okay? He couldn't even post a video of the TikTok on a how-to video on how to put this, the rock into him. You know what I'm talking about? How to hit Goliath in the forehead. I mean, he didn't get to post that stuff. Some of you are like, ooh, TikTok, that'd be fun. <laughs> if we're so focused on what we do, rather than what we're becoming, we'll eventually lose everything. You may be the best keyboard player on the planet, but that's still not what you are. You may be the best business person to ever grace the boardroom, but that's not what you are. You may be able to sell a ketchup popsicle to a woman in white gloves, but you're not a salesman. I remember sitting in a church not too long ago in we were just venturing out into launching our launching and starting casting vision about launching Anchor Church. And we were sitting in a in a Sunday school class in Colby, Kansas. And the teacher asked this question. He said, What is your identity? And Brooke and I were actually sitting almost in the very back row of the class. 
you know, there are times that pastors would like to sit towards the back and not the front all the time. You know, sometimes we need to be fed too. It's okay. And I remember he called on me first. I'm like, man, I'm the guest. What are you doing calling on? Why do you call on the guest first? That's not fun. He's like, well, what are you? And I immediately, I'm a church planter. And the very, before the next person could even talk, there was an incredible amount of conviction that came over me. And for the next few moments, you just listen. I'm an electrician. I'm a clerk. I'm a teacher. I'm a business person. I mean, you just watch. And before the teacher could even get back, I said, hey, can I, can I change my answer? Brooke probably remembers this. It was really awkward because everybody turns around like, why is the guest wanting to change this? Is he wrong? And I said, you know, the reality is I was, and I said this in front of the, and I'm not the one teaching. I was like, I'm wrong. I'm not a church planter. I'm a follower of Jesus. Because that supersedes me being dad. That supersedes me being a husband. That supersedes me being a pastor. That supersedes me being a friend. That su- I do all of that out of following Jesus. You see, David, his purpose was simply to follow God. David may have killed a lion and killed a bear, defeated Goliath. He may have been obedient to his earthly father. He may have served his brothers. He could have fought for all the sheep in the world, but that was still not his identity. We will grow in our gifts when we understand that our gifts are not our identity. David was obedient in following the voice of the Lord. So I wonder some days what would happen if we focused on what we were becoming rather than what we're doing. And here's what would happen. You ready for this? If you're not taking notes, you really should. If we are focused on what we're becoming, we would start learning. And when we start learning, we start growing. Most of us, if we were honest, stopped learning a long time ago. Which meant we stopped growing a long time ago. So the question is, how do we learn? There's a few things I want to walk through with you and. I believe it starts with prayer. We pray like it all depends on God and we work like it all depends on us. Friend, growth starts on your knees and in your prayer closets. Growth starts in your worship, not at your work. We pray and then we work hard. I really believe God hears every prayer that we pray. And God honors every prayer that is prayed. But honoring and answering are not always the same thing. God sees the level of hard work that you put in behind the scenes. He sees your effort in your work ethic. And if you want to grow into who God wants you to be, we have to know, and this is going to be really tough, and I'm going to be honest with you, this, is, this has been wrestling in my spirit for almost two weeks now, a healthy prayer life will not make up for a mediocre work ethic. You can pray all that you want, and if you back your prayer with laziness, don't expect God to answer the prayer in the way you think it should be done. Why would God honor your gift with favor and blessing if you're not ready to honor your gift with hard work? It's like this. Would you expect a pay increase or a job promotion if you can't show up to work on time? You make it to work on time because you chose to be there. So many people pray for skills. Pastor Chanel will be the first to tell you because when you're up on a platform, everybody thinks this is the limelight. This is where people want to be. But you have no idea the hard work that goes to being on a platform like this. This message didn't just show up an hour ago. Pastor Chanel didn't learn how to play a keyboard yesterday. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, these, these, the gifts that God has given us, we've chosen to honor and grow in them. But so many people pray for skills and they pray for opportunities, but we don't back up that prayer with the hard work that is necessary to get the results of making a difference that we hope for. Friends, back up your prayer by putting your hands to work. We pray hard and we work hard. Earn the favor and the blessing by working hard to grow in your gift but it starts with prayer. If God's gifted you, pray about it and then work hard. But part of that is we have to understand one of the greatest joys in life is to spend time in the presence of Jesus. If we want to learn and if we want to grow, we have to pray 
and we have to experience the presence of Jesus. What I love most about Sunday mornings, and I say this, and I mean this, is not that I get to sit up in front of you guys in most Sundays and speak a message. It's not that I get to greet most of you either at the, as you come in or as you leave. What I love the most is experiencing the presence of Jesus. Because worthy is His name. We want to learn if we want to grow. We have to experience the presence of Jesus. And it is in the presence of Jesus and through intentional prayer that my attention becomes focused on who I am becoming and not what I am doing. Friends, prayer changes things and the presence of Jesus changes things. For me to grow, I have to change and that happens through prayer and the presence of Jesus. I am different. I am made new. I am victorious. I am an overcomer. I am strong. I am confident. I am courageous. And I am those things because of the time I spent with Jesus. David didn't leave the battlefield victorious. David showed up to the battlefield victorious because he was walking each step with the voice of the Lord leading him to be all that God wanted him to be. And that's what we should target, to be everything that God wants us to be. And for that to happen, it's going to take prayer. It's going to take times in the presence of Jesus. And it's going to take some practice. Have you ever spent time practicing what God has spoken to you in your times of prayer and in His presence doing it when nobody else is around? If you hear God say drum, then start practicing to drum. If you hear say God teach, say teach kids, then start practicing and putting into practice what it takes to teach kids. If you hear God say you should start welcoming people into your home, then start to welcome people into your home. Honor the voice of the Lord. Honor your gift. Honor your passion. Operating in your gift and in your passion comes with the calling to prepare. We have to pray. We have to be in His presence. We have to practice and we have to prepare. I tell Pastor Luke and Pastor Dalton all of the time, and when the execution of the message presented on Sunday is substandard, the result is usually not a presentation issue. It's a preparation issue. We didn't honor the gift and the blessing in the preparation phase, so the execution suffered. Friends, practice and preparation do not happen in, during the time of execution. David prepared well. He didn't let his emotions guide him, but I promise you they did play a role. And I promise the same is true for every person that I know who serves right here at our church. But if we aren't careful, our emotions will have, an, have a negative effect on our prayer time. Our emotions will have a negative effect on our present, in the time we spend in the presence of Jesus. Our emotions will have a negative effect on our time of practice and preparation. If David had waited to learn how to hear the voice of the Lord until he walked onto the battlefield, David would have went home. Because the truth is about every battle we face, we are constantly battling whether we move forward or we retreat. We either progress or we regress. And what the emo if we allow our emotions to have the primary influence, let's be honest, we're going to go back like David would have where we were comfortable where we knew how we were in control, we're going to walk back into where we were rather than walking into what God wants us to be. But David focused on God. He was focused on where God wanted him to be and he knew if God was for him, then who could be against him? He knew he was blessed so that he could be a blessing. Friends, we are blessed with gifts to be a blessing. Our gifts were given to us intentionally to reach people for Jesus. We learned last week that it starts, we have to identify what God has gifted me to be, what God has gifted me to do. Then I must grow in the gifts and the talents that I have been blessed with. We identify and we grow. You see, your gifts, your talents, your blessings, they're just simply an opportunity 
to serve God. It's an opportunity that you can fight for the sheep, you can fight for your family, fight for your kids, fight for your friends, fight for your neighbors, fight for your community. That's when we put our gifts and our skills and our talents to work. We're fighting so that people can live and experience the presence of Jesus. But it only happens if our heart is right. Had David not approached the battlefield with the right heart, you think David would have ever conquered the Philistine that day? David knew that if God was for me, who could be against me? But David also knew my love for what God has called me to do, which was to be the king of Israel, God, the king of God's chosen people. David's heart was pure and postured after G, after God. It's out of his heart. It's out of his love for people. Because the truth is, David made mistakes. David made poor choices. David fell short of the glory of God because of his sin. But in everything, he tried his best to be obedient. Friend, you're not always going to hit the mark. Your talents are going to come and go. There's a season. The only thing that will last forever is your love for God and your love for people. As we get older, as we mature, as our families start to expand, our interests are going to change. Our gifts don't last forever, so we'd better honor them while we have them and make them work for the kingdom of God now. You see, we as a church family come together identifying our gifts with the commitment to grow. Because here's the thing about growing. We choose to grow or we choose to not. And it is your emotions that will dictate the answer to that question. But when we as a church family come together to identify our gifts, making the commitment to grow in our gifts, we will make a difference in our community. Because our love for God is going to continue to increase. Our love for each other is going to continue to expand. Our love for our community is going to grow to a level of compassion like we've never experienced before. But it takes us using our gifts to make a difference because if I don't, then who will? Because there is somebody who needs to experience the presence of Jesus, needs to experience the grace of Jesus, and the skills and gifts and talents that he's blessed you with are going to be the thing that captivates their attention to where they give Jesus a shot. If not me, then who? How many more people need to say no for you to be willing to say yes? If not now, then when? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? Today, God, we pray for the gift, the courage, the strength to say yes. That, God, we want more of you. That, God, we want to be victorious before we ever walk onto any battlefield. That God, David didn't defeat Goliath that day. He defeated Goliath many years before. That God, I don't know what you're preparing me for. I don't know who's going to cross my path tomorrow or two years from now. But God, if I'm not obedient today, it's going to be a real struggle to be obedient tomorrow. That when David chose to be obedient and as the future king of Israel and he chose to go back out into the fields and keep tending to the sheep, Lord, he chose to say, I am going to listen to the voice of the Lord. When he tells me go, I will go because if God is for me, who can be against me? God, I may be insecure. I may not even understand. God, I may not have every answer to the question I may not even be the most talented and gifted, but God, I today commit to praying. I commit to being in your presence. And God, I commit today to prepare that if I've heard your voice and you are saying to go, Lord, I'm going to start taking steps to go. You may not be ready for me to jump off that cliff just yet, but you're trying to get me closer to the edge. And Lord, the closer I get to the edge, the more I feel your approval, the more I feel your grace and your mercy and your presence. God, speak to us today. Give us clear direction. Let your voice be so clear that God, there is no questioning the direction you're wanting us to walk. Because God, we're going to come across to Goliath someday. 
And if we didn't defeat the Goliath in our past, God, give us the courage today to defeat the, the Goliath in our future, that we can have victory today because the battle has already been won because we are your chosen people, loved by our gracious God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.